All right, good afternoon everybody, or is it good noon because it's 12 o'clock, top of the hour. Not quite afternoon, not quite morning. Not really sure what to make of that. Anyways, I'm Joanna Hill. Welcome back to my channel today. I'm gonna to be walking you through uh, painting a sea turtle with gouache. Um, I've got a reference photo and a line drawing available for download at my website, which is jhillfineart.com forward slash tutorials. And you'll see all the supplies that I'm using today and also the links to download the line drawing and the reference photo so that you can trace it onto your painting surface and paint along with me. And just wanna make sure everything's live and good to go. I think we're good. So, okay. so. I will tell you what I did first because I am, I currently have my line drawing onto my uh, painting surface and I started off with just a, I printed out, well first I drew the design and then I printed or I traced it out on some tracing paper which then I used a light box which looks just like this. This is a Hueon tablet light box. It's a, I think this is an 11 by 14. And I used this to put my line drawing on top of this, like so. And then I placed my watercolor paper, which is what I'm using to paint on today, on top of my light box. So when you turn the light box on, the light comes through the bottom and you are able to see all these line drawings um, or the lines and you can trace it onto whatever it is that you want to paint on. So if you don't have a light box, you can even use a bright open window and just tape those um, images together and you it's basically the same thing. So these are not very expensive. I think I bought this one for like maybe $40 off of Amazon super handy they come in different sizes i have a very large one and this is kind of my portable one that i can use for uh, you know lessons and things when i'm on the go so anyways i am using um 140 pound hot pressed watercolor paper from fabriano artistico it looks just like this and it is acid-free, lignin-free. It's not going to yellow over time, which is super important when you're doing any kind of artwork and you want it to last. So this is actually a watercolor block. All these pages are stuck together. They have like a, a glued edge and there is a, a, here's the corner that's free. It's intentionally kind of loose like that so you can get a palette knife to separate those pages when you're done. So because I wanted to trace my line drawing on using my light box, I went ahead and just took out a sheet. I didn't leave it attached and I just reattached it to a MDF board with some duct tape. So this is not just regular duct tape. This is a pH neutral masking tape from Blake Art Materials. So that will ensure that I don't get any residue that's left onto my paper that will yellow my paper over time. So very important. Okay, so what am I going to be using today? So I've got the reference photo right above me so you can follow along. And I am going to be using gouache paint. If you're unfamiliar with what gouache paint is, it is an opaque watercolor. And I'm also gonna be using something called acrylic gouache, which is like a gouache paint, but it has an acrylic binder to it, so it does not reactivate with water. So I can use that as my base layer and then use my traditional gouache on top, which does reactivate with water. And I can use that on top and the two will sort of stay separated. So it's a great way if you are an artist that likes to work through layering. Hmm. I've got my coffee. I hope you have a tasty beverage with you today. And um, so let's go ahead and just dive in here. So this is what I'm using for my acrylic gouache. I'm kind of mainly using this just for the background. Um, 
I'm actually kind of undecided. I was flip-flopping to kind of figure out what I really wanted to do with the background. My reference photo, you know, has those really deep blues and it's got some turquoise and some sky blues, but I really kind of wanted to leave this very loose and sort of more abstract. And I kind of just want to do some blotches of color. I don't want to fully paint the background. So I may even leave the background for last because I don't, I want to be able to use the liquid frisket, which is this, to go around my drawing. That way I can do, maybe I could even switch to watercolor instead of the acrylic gouache to do a background. That will bleed a lot better if you want sort of that runny kind of look that watercolor gives you. So I'm kind of undecided, I'm on the fence. So maybe I'll just start off with doing sort of an underpainting on the sea turtle and then maybe I'll just think about the background. So either way, whichever you prefer how to do your background, it's totally up to you. But I usually put it in a little bottle like this. It's got a needle nose so I can get a really fine line with this liquid frisket. It's kind of like a, a rubber cement and it keeps whatever is whatever your watery sort of runny substance, it keeps it from sort of spreading into areas that you don't want it to. So super handy. Okay, so I'm gonna put on a little bit of background music. I just got some classical going. Hopefully it's not too loud. You might not even be able to hear it. <laughs> but it gives me something to listen to. I always like to have some sort of music going on in the background. Okay, so do I want to do the background or not? I don't think so. I think I'm just gonna dive in and start doing the turtle and I'm just gonna think about it. So one thing I do have here is I went ahead and made swatches of all of my colors. Now this is in traditional gouache. I have not done this in the acrylic gouache but I can just open the cap and kind of see what colors I have that are closest to my traditional. But this is very handy when you are trying to color match something, um, knowing what to color to work with to get to where you want to go. So I suggest just swatching it out, um, all the colors that you have available, super handy. So what I did was the top square is, um, straight out of the tube, paint straight out of the tube. The bottom square or rectangle is that same color mixed with white. And then the one sort of this vertical stripe here is the tube color mixed with a little bit of gray. So that gives me a good indication of which directions this color is going to take when I manipulate it with white or gray or black so on and so forth. What I didn't do was mix it with other colors, um, but that, that's for another time. So I'm gonna start off with just kind of doing a very thin base coat and just kind of color block, just getting local colors in the sections. Um, I've outlined everything in a micron pen, which look like these. They are waterproof and they are archival so they will not bleed when you put water over top of them. Okay, let's see. So looking at our little friend here, he has a lot of cooler yellows, very light green colors, because he's getting that reflection of the teal water and you know re reflections of off the ocean floor so he's getting a lot of those on his neck and on top there's a lot of sort of browns and siennas and sort of a bone white kind of color so those are colors that I can kind of quickly um, kind of get to and, and think about because I think I have colors right out of the tube that are those so good place to start 
So I've got beige, which I think would be good for the cream color in between those dark patches of, I guess you really can't call, call them scales. I don't know what they are. They're like, I don't know, his, his pattern, I suppose. So we'll use that. I need a sienna. I've got a sepia for brown. I don't have many colors in acrylic gouache, so this is going to be challenging. I think the sepia is going to be fine. This is just an underpainting per se, so I'm not too concerned about getting the colors right because I'm probably just going to go over top of it anyway. Um, I've got this ash rose color. Let's see what this looks like. That's a really pretty color. I don't... I do see this in some spots. Maybe I'll keep that out just in case I need it, but we'll see. I do see a lot of gray and some teal colors. Let's see, I've got my, um, in case you see me looking down, I have my tablet here, which I have my reference photo on, and that just gives me a nice, good, um, reference to look at um, using the tablet or your computer gives you a better resolution than if you just were to print it out on your printer let's see here okay so i've got sepia beige ash rose white i do need gray but i don't have gray in acrylic wash i do have black so we can mix gray and i need something for that teal color i have this peacock blue which I can mix with the beige and the white to get me something close so we'll just start there and see how it goes so we're just trying to get close colors so on my palette here I am using a tin this is just an empty tin from some pencils that I had and it just makes a really nice um, painting surface that I can just use for whatever. I usually use it for gouache because since gouache, traditional gouache is water activated, I can just rinse it off when I'm done. But with the acrylic gouache, it dries like plastic, like an acrylic paint kind of typically does. So I don't, I always like to use something a little more, um, disposable so I don't have to really scrape it with you know a razor blade or something like that so I've got a paper towel that I just put some water on and this is just a piece of scratch tracing paper that I have to use as my disposable palette paper you can use palette paper or you can just use a paper plate if you wanted to it doesn't really matter so the paper towel is there to keep the paper temperature cool so uh, I live in a very warm state and typically this paint dries extremely fast. So if you have a water media that dries quickly, having something that is cool underneath it will keep it sort of, um, keep it from drying out as fast. So I, I do that with my, because I can't reactivate it with water. So I apologize, it looked like the image, the video feed was buffering there for a minute. I'm not sure how my connection is. Okay, I've got my sepia. So I'll just show you what I'm doing here. And I'm gonna keep my darks pretty far away from my lights. And this is a Holbein brand, Holbein acrylic gouache. Holbein is a, I think they're a Japanese brand, but they, um, they're light fast, or at least they're supposed to be light fast, so that pigments won't fade over time. Okay, so let me grab my palette knife. 
can find it. And let's see if we can't mix a little bit of white with that peacock blue to make our green. Ooh, that is strong. I'm gonna add a little bit of sepia, try and brown that out a little. Maybe even a little bit of this beige to add some yellow into it. Oh dear. Okay. <laughs> So I didn't think about this, but using the, uh, this is tracing paper that I'm using it on and it's totally absorbing the water and sort of falling apart. I don't recommend using this, the, um, the palette or use a palette paper. That's not going to fall apart. Don't use tracing paper. I think the paper plate would have been a better choice at this point. All right. So just wiping off my palette knife, keeping that clean and let's just go ahead and start color blocking. So I'm going to get a brush. We we'll use a round brush. This one is just a, I think this one is a synthetic squirrel. I actually just got this brush. I got it from Hobby Lobby. They had them on sale. I think they're getting rid of their synthetic squirrel hair brushes. I've never used one before, but it's really soft. So it's meant for like watercolor and um, we'll see how it goes. So I can immediately tell that this is not yellow enough. A little too blue. And this is a round brush number eight. I'm going to add a little bit of this beige right on top. So gouache paint dries very fast and it has some sort of chalk consistency in it that gives it a very matte finish. That's one of the, um, Oops, I just went out of lines there. I, that's one of the characteristics about gouache is the matte finish. And it looks really cool if you haven't used gouache before. It's very different from other paint mediums and it's one of my favorites. You should definitely try it. All right, I'm going to take a little bit of this ash rose. I'm going to mix a little bit of that blue mixture we have. I'll scoop this over so you can see what I'm doing. I'm sort of aiming in between like his neck region. It's a little bit in shadow. So I'm going to put a teeny bit of black just to gray it out, but I want it fairly translucent. So I'm putting some extra water in it and I want to be able to see my lines right through the paint. You can see I, let me zoom in just a pinch here. You can see the ink lines through the paint, which is what you want. So technically we're kind of doing a little bit of a line and wash. And I'm just putting it where I see this darker value. So it's kind of the core shadow of his neck.
Now it starts to get a little bit more blue. And add a little bit more of that beige to kind of give it some more yellow tint. And we'll just get the front of that neck. If you do end up covering over some of your line art, just have that line drawing printout handy because that will tell you where to replace those lines later should you choose to uh, keep them. So I could have done this in watercolor since I'm pretty much diluting the paint to a wash consistency, but um, I don't want this to move when it's dry. So that's why I chose the acrylic wash because I don't want it to reactivate with water, which I think to a certain degree watercolor will. I'm gonna add more to his chin. So, so far the only colors I've used was a peacock blue, which is like a bluish green, and then a beige, which was that kind of like a bone white And I'm just paying attention to where the shadow shapes are. It needs to be more yellow or more beige. And these colors aren't strong, so I'm, I have to add in a little bit of black to gray it out to desaturate those colors. So if you have a color that is too intense, just add a little bit of gray. And I'm at the point where I think I need to switch out brushes. This is getting a little bit too big for me to control now that I'm getting into some smaller areas. So I'm gonna switch over to, we'll try this little filbert here. This one's a number six filbert. This is a Taclon bristle brush. Again, from Hobby Lobby. I love their brushes, they're cheap, and they work well. So his beak, I guess you can call it a beak. I'm not gonna worry about the details of it, so I just want to get a foundational color for it, so I'm just gonna continue on with this sort of brownie color. Maybe a little bit more yellow. And actually I got that backwards. This should be, a, I guess you could call it his upper lip <laughs> was actually slightly brighter than the top. So let me go down in value real quick. Oop, had a little bit of blue on there. There we go. Just take your time, it's not, don't rush it, because you don't want to get sloppy. You want to be able to get in the lines, very much like a coloring book. To me, that helps keep me organized if I can just stay in the lines. I'm not a loose painter. So 
that's all I'm looking for, just real basic. Now I could add a little bit of sepia because he does have sort of this patch right here. And that's a rather large shape. So I don't mind adding that in currently. I'm not going to worry about blending this together because I'm just going to go on top of it anyway later. Okay, so I'm going to start filling in some of his large spots. He kind of looks like a giraffe, kind of. But on the top of his head, you can see there are some lighter brown colors. So I'm going to take a little bit of sepia I'm going to mix it with the Ash Rose. So just a little bit of sepia because it's quite strong, quite dark. Maybe a little bit more. I'm going to add a little bit of this beige. And I'm going to fill in just the spots where I see that color. Sometimes on the top of his head, like some of these lines sort of run together. So I'm just doing the best I can to get the color where it lives, even though it may overlap a section but I'm just gonna do my best. I'm gonna switch to a smaller brush. I'm gonna turn this down even a little bit more. There we go, I can sort of hear myself talk a little bit. Hopefully that wasn't too loud for too long. All right, so I'm switching to a round brush. This one's a number two Princeton Velvet Touch. I love these brushes. You used to be able to get them from Hobby Lobby and then they stopped carrying them. Hobby Lobby, if you're listening, shame on you. These were fantastic brushes. Were. So now I get them um, elsewhere on the internet. All right, I'm just filling this in. This one's a little bit mishmashed. There's a little bit more sepia sort of down in the bottom. And then it's just this kind of light brown color on top. So I'm gonna get a little bit of sepia. Not quite dark enough. and give it sort of an irregular shape there. And this is why I really enjoy using hot pressed watercolor paper for gouache because trying to do little details like this or painting small it's very hard to get nice smooth edges with a rough textured paper. So highly recommend sticking with a hot press paper if you're doing gouache. It just makes it a lot easier to control. Unless you're a loose painter and you like more of that painterly look
And I am painting right on top of dry paper, so I'm not wetting my sections. I'm just carefully filling all this in. Now some of these darker spots right on his cheek have a little bit more of that sort of grayish beige color mixed in with it. So I'm going to start just kind of dabbing on this dark color and leaving some spaces for the that grayish color. One thing I will notice or notate too is this acrylic gouache, I think it actually stays wetter longer because I haven't had to spray my palette yet with water. I keep wanting to go for my coffee cup. I've done that before, it's not good. Okay, I think this is the last really dark spot on him, or on his face anyway. Um. I might get under here. Right underneath his eye is quite dark. And again, this is just the sepia that I'm using. Got a few little dark spots right above his, I guess you could call it his eyebrow. Not quite an eyebrow, but in between these little ridges here. And I'm just trying to replicate it best I can. I'm staying away from doing any sort of detail work because I'm not there yet. Just trying to get 
the basic shapes down. Bunch of dog hair on here. Okay. So back to, we want some of that, like a grayish color. I'm gonna take a little bit of this beige that's on my palette already. This color right here, I'm gonna mix it with a little bit of black. Maybe a little bit more beige. It is a warm gray that I'm after, so I'm using that beige for warmth because it has a little bit of yellow, and the black for the gray. And I'm just gonna go in and fill in the rest of these freckles. We'll call them freckles. Don't actually know what they are. Classical music. There we go. Put that back. I think it's much easier to keep yourself organized when you have just basic shapes down with the correct value. At least for me, it helps keep me organized and I don't get lost. There's so many colors, so many values going on with this painting. And maybe I'll add a little bit more there. <clears throat> This one right here is almost, it's not quite brown. It's got more of that kind of tealy yellow color. And right on the front of his neck is a little bit more grayed out too, and it's lighter. Okay, so let's go ahead and get the inside here. So I'm going to use a little bit more of that beige. I'm going to add some white to it. So I've got something kind of like this. It's pretty bright on the paper, but I don't want to use white just yet. So we'll just sort of make it an off white. Just painting in between all those little freckles, <laughs> for lack of better words. Now this one's a little bit gray as it gets around his eye. Keeping that value light, even though this part is in shadow. All right, back to this light beige color. And just painting in between all these little bumps. 
you have a hard time with your paint, if it's just not flowing, just add a little bit more water to it. And that goes for um, if you're painting with acrylic also, just add a little bit more water. Any sort of water medium, if your paint's too dry, it's not really going to let you flow with it. Now I'm going for more of an illustrative style, so I'm not going for my usual hyper-realistic style of painting. When I use gouache paints, I tend to be more, more loose, just because the nature of the paint, you know, I struggle with getting realism when it comes to using gouache. Getting a little bit of a deeper gray color. There's a shadow that comes right down here. I'm just gonna just notate so I know that there is a shadow there. That way I don't forget to add that in later. You can see now as I'm progressing through here how very easily it could be to get lost in this painting. Because there's just so much patterns and shapes that you have to keep track of. And the color shifts, you know, from, you know, imagine his head is kind of a shape like an egg, so all the highlights and lighter toned colors are going to be towards the top and everything below it's going to be in shadow so you have to just kind of figure out and watch out for those those shifts in color and shifts in value as you move around the turtle's head but don't overthink it So this back side of his head, I'm just painting the base of it with this cream color because I can then paint over it with those small little tiny dots that you see. It's a lot easier to imagine all these wrinkles away and all the lines because it's easier to get the gradation from one color to another to another first and then go back and put your um, details in, so much easier doing it that way. Now we're getting into a little bit more of this brown color. The ash rose, this is a really nice color. It's very subtle. Sip of coffee. Okay, moving on. So that's all I'm gonna do for him. I guess we could fill in his eye. I'm gonna use, instead of just straight black, I'm gonna add a little bit of this blue, that peacock blue, just to give his eye some color. Maybe even a little bit of the sepia. You know, it may kind of look like just black, but in real life, 
the human eye will pick up those colors. And it just makes your blacks look more interesting and black by itself is can be very flat. I'm going to mix a little bit of a lighter value, just picking up some of that light gray that I had on my palette. And I'm just going to add in that little tiny highlight right here. It needs to be a little bit brighter, but we can go back and make that brighter later. Because this eye is not just all black. There is still some values in there. If you look close, that's why it's really good to have a high quality reference photo so when you can zoom in you can see those subtle changes. Okay so let's finish out his flipper over here. I'm going to move to a larger brush. I'm going to go back to that filbert that number six and I'm going to fill in this area. So I'm going to change tactics. I'm just going to go over it with the whole light, with the light um, beige color because I can go over that with the dark and I don't have to paint around the dark like I did. So work smarter, not harder. <laughs> Add a little bit of that rose color, that ash rose. Try and do a little bit of blending while it's still wet. Okay, a little bit more of this beige, a little bit of white, teeny weeny bit of black. Maybe a little bit more white and a little bit more water to dilute, not to dilute it, to make it more translucent so I can see these lines. Now, I don't know why I didn't do that before. Just do the base white color and then go on top of it with the brown. That would have been so much easier. Sometimes you just don't think when you're doing art. Just your brain just decides to do what it wants. All right, rinse out my brush. And I'm gonna go back to my small brush, my small round and fill in where the darker, darkest dark freckles are. <laughs> I really don't know what they're called, spots. If you know what they're called, leave it in the comments. We have, um, so I live in Southern Georgia and we have this place called Jekyll Island and they have a sea turtle rescue there where you can go in and learn about sea turtles and um, you can actually see some that are in their little sea turtle hospital. It's, it's really a cute place to go. So if you ever find yourself on Jekyll Island in Georgia, go check it out. They do good things there.
Okay, put a little bit more water in my paint. So I'm gonna move my reference photo real quick. And just fill these in. Just take your time. It's not a race. <laughs> Gosh, I sound like my dad. It's not a race, slow down. He would always quote that song, Slow Ride by Fog Hat, when he was teaching us how to drive when we were getting our permit. Slow ride, take it easy. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't decide to do the entire turtle because like painting these little tiny spots this is going to get old real quick. I'm not a very patient artist, at least. I, I feel like as I've gotten older, I have less patience for things. And artwork really forces me to slow down because I have my own standards of how I want my artwork to look, which requires a lot of patience. <laughs> You know, I used to be able to just sit and draw for hours when I was younger and, you know, not skip a beat. But now that I'm older, I can't sit for very long. It's like I've developed ADD. I probably do have ADD. Okay, so not all of these are dark brown. Towards the front of his flipper, they start to get into that lighter, more like kind of burnt sienna sort of color. So watch out for that change. Okay, continuing on. A little bit more water in my paint. I feel like these can be a little bit more random, you know. If they're not perfect, they're close, you know, these little spots. It's really kind of hard to get them exactly like the picture. All right, let's go into a little bit more of that ash rose and mix it with our sepia color, our dark brown. And we will fill in the rest of these with a lighter value of this brown. I think I want a little bit more rose. 
They actually have a little bit more red in them, but I don't want to go that far into the red spectrum just yet. I'm just trying to keep it simple with these paints because most of the detail work I'm going to be doing with traditional gouache. This is just a color blocking just to get some paint down on the paper. Just give me a place to start. But I'm looking for correct values and the color being in the right ballpark. Just keep it simple. Don't overthink it. little bit more water. Oh, thank God, last spot. Whew. Starting to get a little rough there, y'all. Okay, let's kind of add, I know there's going to be a lot of wrinkles and little spots and doohickeys along here, but we can at least get some marked in with the acrylic gouache. That way it doesn't move and we can kind of get some of these patterns started. Just right there. I guess you could add some other ones here as well. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at his shell. Now, I've added a lot of stuff to this picture. This um, reference photo originally came from um, Pixabay or Unsplash.com. It's a royalty-free uh, website that you can get good reference photos from. So I tend to go on there a lot to get some whatever it is I want to draw. But I try to change them and make them more unique to me. So um, I'm trying to work on a personal goal, which is just better compositions in general. So I added the seaweed, the seaweed, seagrass, and some barnacles and some air bubbles. So I don't have a reference photo for those, but by all means, go to one of those websites, type in seagrass or seaweed or barnacles, just to give yourself an idea of what those look like. So what's going to clue me in most is the the light source so i have a general idea of what these shapes look like but i need to imagine how the shadows and the light play when i have a light source coming from the top down and some reflections from the bottom up of the ocean floor so um it's a lot to wrap your head around but if you are experienced with doing a lot of light studies um, you shouldn't have a problem just sort of going off on your own, but feel free to go and look at some photos. Just keep in mind where the light source is coming from, and um, that will help you to imagine where to paint the shadows, or you can just follow me. Okay, so back to this shell. We've got more of that um, brownish red. It's actually even more so that I'm actually going to go ahead and grab another color that's more red because it really is getting stronger. I don't have a sepia color or not a sepia, like a burnt sienna. What do I have? I've got the ash rose. I could probably add Let's see where I'm looking at my, I have a uh, color wheel on my wall 
And so I often reference it just to see where I'm at on the color wheel. That way I can kind of get an idea of what colors I need to add to get to a specific spot on, uh, on the color wheel. So I've got this ash rose color, which is in the red family. And I need to get more to the burnt sienna, which is not quite full strength color. It's between, you know, the orange and the red family. So it's like an orangey red, but also gray. So this ash rose that I have is more leaning towards the red family. So I need more orangey color, but I still need a little bit of a stronger red. So I'm gonna take out yellow ochre, which is a very warm yellow, but it's also a desaturated yellow. It's not, um, it's not super, super bright like a lemon yellow would be. So that will knock down the value a little bit. And then I'm gonna add a little bit of some wine red, which is a cooler red. The color that we're looking for is not quite a bright fire engine red per se. It's a little bit more cooler toned. So let's, let's see what we got. So I've got both my reds here. So we'll take a little bit of this red, a little bit of this yellow, a little bit of the ash, a little bit more red, a little bit more yellow. I think the red is a little too cool. So let's, I do, I do think I, I'm gonna change my mind. I'm gonna go with the carmine. Oh, I'm just getting paint all over my fingers. I'm gonna go with the carmine, which is more of a warm red red. All right, let's try that again. And I'm gonna use a larger brush Okay, so let's just take what I had already and I'm just gonna add some more of this bright red. More ochre. A little bit of this ash rose to sort of tone that down. There, it's a little bit more um, it's got a little bit more punch, a little bit more intense of a color, which is what I was looking for. And I'm just going to fill in these spots up front here. On his shell. Well, that was delayed. It's hard to talk and paint at the same time. I really admire all those YouTubers that can just do a live stream and just talk the whole way through and be perfectly natural. Obviously, I know that comes with practice, but, and I'm getting better. I feel like I'm getting better. I'm getting more comfortable being in front of the camera, even though I'm basically talking to myself most of the time. And I, I kind of wish I had a little more people to ask questions because that makes it easier. I'm sort of leaving a gap at the bottom of the shell because that's where it starts to curve over and there is a significant shadow along the bottom portion of his shell. So all of this color that I'm painting now is more in the light source. But I will change colors when I get to that bottom portion.
There we go. Last one. All right, then we're done that portion of the shell. The back part of his shell, the main part, there's a lot of streakiness going on where it looks like there's scratches, maybe even some moss growing. So a lot of that sort of striations, I guess you want to call them, there's a lot of, I'm going to probably do a lot of dry brushing. So I'm going to, it's not quite as red as this, so I'm going to add in a little bit of the sepia to my sienna mixture that I just made. And I'm just going to kind of dry brush a little bit. just to kind of start that pattern. And there's a lot of other colors that are gonna be coming into play with this particular part of the shell too. Um, but I want the directions. So there are significant directions to these patterns. So this one's going sort of inward where those ones were going sort of upward could have put a little bit more upward, but this just sort of sets the stage for me. And then I just kind of go back. But there's a lot of purples in here. There's some yellows, dark browns, some cream colors. So things to watch out for when we get to that point when we switch to our different paint. And I'm just going to do some dry brushing on his neck too, just to start some of that. Just to start some of the texture. It's good enough for now. Okay, so now we get to paint in between those lines again. I'm going to go back to my round brush here. I'm going to go right into that sepia color and it's fairly dark here. There are some values, but we're just simplifying. So I think this is okay for simplifying some of that shadow color. Now there's going to be a shadow here that I'm actually adding not a very strong shadow but there will be one from this piece of seaweed that i added in add a little bit more water to my mixture I'm going to add a little bit of some gray to this sepia color. So just added a little black and white just to make it more gray toned because it's in shadow. So it's going to, the color of it is not going to be as strong, even though it is dark, but the shadow, the gray color is going to help it appear like it's in shadow. Try and stay in the lines there. Okay. Maybe I'll lighten that up a little bit. Okay, so now I'm gonna get my white mixture. 
little bit of white, a little bit of beige, maybe a pinch, just a tiny pinch of this gray, just to gray it down a little bit so it's not so bright. And I'm going to go in between these lines here. Usually a good rule of thumb is you kind of want to leave your white like straight from the tube for very small areas because usually there isn't really pure white on your reference photo unless it's like an a obvious highlight. And so if you use white right out the gate and it can sort of flatten your picture out because you're already going at, you're already painting with the full value scale and sometimes less is more, less white is more. So you can play more with, um, you know, your midtones, and then you can really um, up the contrast by adding your black blacks and your whitest whites when you're done to really kind of make things pop. So be very careful about um, using too light of values from the start. Okay. Doo -doo -doo. I'm not really sure what color I'm gonna make the barnacles. I actually... <laughs> don't really know what color barnacles are. Um, I just imagine them being kind of like brown and corally and gray, kind of like, you know, rocks or something. Um, I'm gonna have to look it up. Okay. Barnacle. What color is a barnacle? Barnacle. Some of them are actually white. Now that is interesting. Some of them look kind of gray. Gosh, these look horrifying. These things are ugly. <laughs> okay, so they're definitely kind of like a seashell gray color, you know? Those typical white grayish seashells that you find on the beach. And they have a little mouth. They're kind of creepy looking. They look like little aliens. Oh, this one's pretty though. This one's kind of white with some pinky stripes. Okay, so I'm gonna go with just this off-white color. We'll start there. And then maybe I'll add some little pinky stripes in later. We'll like, we'll make them look pretty because they're kind of ugly. We wouldn't want our sea turtles to have ugly barnacles. All right, the last part we're gonna do is the seaweed. I'm gonna save the air bubbles for last because I need to do a little bit more research on, I guess you could say the anatomy of a sea, of a, a bubble underwater as far as the lighting goes. Um, there is a web, not a website, it's a, another YouTuber, his name is, um, the drawing researcher, art researcher. I'm gonna look it up. I think it's Mink. Mink, the art researcher. Yeah, it's Mink, M I N K, the drawing researcher. Check out his YouTube video. Um, he's got a great YouTube video on lighting when it comes to bubbles in different environments. So like the reflections of a bubble underwater is going to be different than like you're blowing a bubble, you know, in open air. It has a lot to do with refraction and how light sort of changes when it goes through different substances. It sort of changes the image, like reversing it from up and down or left to right. 
Anyways, go check out his channel. It's Mink the Art Research Drawing Researcher. And he's got a really good one on bubbles underwater. So I'm going to kind of refresh my memory from that because it's been a long time since I've seen that web or that video. But I'm definitely going to be referencing it because I want to get these bubbles relatively accurate. So maybe not picture perfect, but you know, ballpark. So it's it's somewhat believable. Okay. And these are so small, I don't really need them to be have an underpainting with um, the acrylic gouache. I'm not too worried about it. So I'm going to go grab some greens now for my seaweed. And what kind of greens do I have available? So I've got grass green and I have sap green. So sap green is going to be a lot more on the yellow side and the grass green is going to be a much cooler tone it's going to have more blue undertones to it which i'm going to opt for this one because we are dealing with a lot of underwater tones so lots of blues and i'm going to switch to a i'm going to go back to my number six filbert and i'm going to add a little bit of this green to my pile of off-white, my grayish white. So now it's sort of like a minty. I'm gonna add a little bit of this blue too. It's a little too green. I want it to be green, but the tops of it, well, maybe this is more of like an under, like if the reflected light underneath is quite cool. I'll use that as a cooler green. That way it gives sort of a reflected, reflected light illusion where that cool green is being bounced back up from the bottom ocean. The bottom ocean, the ocean floor. See, I can't speak when I'm just doing artwork. <laughs> But I want muted muted greens. I don't want strong greens. I think I do want a little bit of a warmer green for the top because that's where our sunlight rays are coming down. So I put a little bit of that yellow ochre into it and a little bit of, let's put a little bit of white because I want this fairly light. Can always go darker, but just Yeah, nice and soft. I don't want anything too strong just yet. So I want my warmer colors for the tops of the seaweed that's facing the surface because warmer light is coming from the sun and warmer light has tones of yellows in it. And that will also give the illusion of form because more warm tones are, they get to the human eye first, warmer tones. The human eye will pick up warmer tones first. So it'll give the appearance that it's closer to you where the cooler tone colors kind of push into the background more. All right, I, I'm gonna switch back and forth between my this one and the round brush. If you hear my dog snoring, I'm sorry. She's uh, on the floor sleeping next to me. She's being a very good girl. Usually she's a pain in the butt and just kind of paces around the room because she's bored and 
But then if you kick her out of the room, she doesn't want to be alone, and then she starts barking. She's about 14 years old. She's a 14-year-old lab, and she's just a, just an old battle axe. She's my girl. All right, I'm going to switch to a larger brush because if you have a large brush, you can cover more area. But if you can't control it, stick with a small brush. And one thing you don't want to do is if you don't have a brush in use, don't leave it sitting in your water cup because it's bad and it's going to ruin your brushes. It makes your tip, the tip of the brush curl. So don't do that. But if you have a paintbrush that has paint on it that dries really fast, just rinse it off. All right, I need to mix a little bit more paint, so a little bit more green. A little bit of white, a little bit of ochre, pinch of gray, and we're back in business. A little bit more ochre. Pinch of water. So I'm just getting the areas where it is facing the surface of the water because that's where this warmer green is going to live. This particular piece right here, I haven't decided if I'm going to put like a cast shadow on it. I might. So we might end up changing that color later, but for now, it will have this color. I'm going to stop about this way because it's changing positions, changing um, light sources. So it's kind of going into a different direction. So that value is going to change. The color temperature is going to change. It's all about that form. Form and the light source. So everything under here is kind of underneath the body of our sea turtle. So I think I'm going to paint those pieces with just the cooler greens. And then once we start painting with the traditional gouache, I'll add more gray tones and blue tones to make it look more three-dimensional, but just in the shadow side of the painting. black just to gray it out even more but I want more blue
careful not to paint over your lines or if you do make sure your paints transparent enough We're just about done here with our color blocking. And then we can let it dry and start painting on top with more color and our traditional gouache. So just filling the rest of this in. Trying not to get sloppy as we get to the end. Went out of the lines just a little bit. And there we go. Okay, so I think this is a pretty good start. Oh, we forgot that piece right there. That should be a warm green. So that is facing the surface of the water. There we go. Okay, so I think we've got a good start here. I'll zoom back out. Not too bad. I think it looks pretty cool so far. I hope this was easy enough for you to follow along. If you have questions, please leave them in the comments and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Um, I also do one-on-one -on -one coaching, virtual or in person, if you live in Southeast Georgia. Uh, just go ahead and follow this link to my website, which is jhillfineart at or jhillfineart.com and you can find all sorts of stuff on there. You can find links to the um, materials that I use and also uh, pricing as far as one-on-one -on -one coaching goes. Um, other tutorials might be on there as well as also with merchandise if you like to collect prints or original artworks. Um, go ahead and check out that website and I will see y'all back Let's make a time for next week. You know, let's go ahead and do, we'll tentatively put next Saturday for our next live stream, but I might change days. So um, I'll at least give you a two day notice. So let's just say it's next Saturday, which is the, 14th of October. I might change that depending on my schedule and um, but I'll definitely give y'all give you a heads up uh, next time I am going live. So thanks so much for watching and take care.